This broadcast of the Hamptons Institute at Guildhall is being brought to you by Bridgehampton National Bank. Hello. Thank you all so much for uh, joining us this afternoon. Um, my name is Michael Gudkowski, and I'm going to moderate um, a discussion about the evolution of digital and digital media. And uh, this is a pretty um, esteemed yet loose group here. So um, we want lots of questions and lots of participation. And um, we're really excited to uh, chat with you about some of the things that we see from a consumer perspective, um, what's happening in the marketplace, and how things are evolving. So some quick introductions, um, starting um, at the very end. Um, please meet uh, Christine Cook. Um, Christine is the Senior Vice President of Advertising for The Daily, which is the um, the daily newspaper tablet that has been developed and put into market about um, February 2nd. Um, Christine has um, had many uh, senior uh, sales and marketing roles in digital um, with the Financial Times, with Martha Stewart Living Omnimedia, with IAC, and I'm delighted to have you here today. Yeah. Clap, clap, clap. Uh, right next to her is um, Anthony Ricicato. Um, Anthony is the GM of Tremor Media and um, has been a digital marketer since digital marketing began, essentially. And uh, I've known Anthony for quite some time. Um, he's, he's held many different roles in a number of uh, great companies, including DoubleClick, um, which was one of the pioneer companies in the digital advertising space. And delighted to have you uh, as well today. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Michael. Uh, next to Anthony is Michael Kelly, and Michael Kelly is the Chief Marketing Officer of Ad Genesis, um, which is a, um, I'll let you tell them a little bit more about it when we get to it, but um, really a transformative um, advertising um, business um, focusing on um, a, 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 a a paradigm shift in, in how advertising is delivered to consumers. Um, Michael has uh, had a, a great career with uh, PwC. Um, most recently, he was the chief marketing officer of PwC and worked with some of the biggest brands um, in, in the world, um, including AT&T on their digital strategy. Um, he was also um, very instrumental in launching Hulu, which is the, um, the, the video uh, service uh, that is joint owned by a number of media companies. So welcome, Michael. And last but certainly not least is um, David Stewart. Um, and David, uh, I, gosh, I've known David for a very long time. Um, we were um, um, uh, colleagues with Martha Stewart Living Omnimedia many, many years ago. And he has um, built um, many, many um, consumer-facing brands working on things like People Magazine, Martha Stewart Living Omnimedia, TV Guide. And, um, and now a really interesting art business. And uh, I, I thought it would be great for you to actually tell us a little bit about your business to sort of get started. And Christine, maybe you can, um, Christine is going to be our AV person uh, today as well as one of the panelists. Hopefully you guys can see that. Great, so um, you know what, I'm gonna stand up actually. Um, Great to see you all here today. Uh, thanks for being inside on what's probably one of the most beautiful days of the summer. Nice to have you all here. Um, so I hail from uh, an interesting intersection, the intersection of art and the internet. And they're two worlds that have been pretty separate for a, a long time. And the company is 20 by 200. We have a pretty basic premise that art doesn't have to be expensive to be good. It doesn't mean that there's not expensive art that is good, because we all know there is, but they're not mutually exclusive. And we think that there are a lot of people out there that love art and aren't able to find work that they really like. <laughs> Part of the problem is the wonderful warm reception most of us get when we go to a gallery. <laughs> if you've been to many, this is what you've seen. And the woman not only starts in that position, she stays in that position. <laughs> and the gallery world, in many ways, is designed to intimidate, I would argue, more than it is to really bring people to an understanding and an appreciation of art. And our founder, Jen Beckman, 
set out to try to fix that. This is the baggage. <laughs> a lot of us have a lot of baggage around art because of the way we've been treated in the past. And uh, we often think of art as sort of, you know, the, the high holies, you know? There's something that goes on back there. We don't understand it. We're told it's important, but we're never supposed to really get it ourselves. So Jen started, she opened a gallery in 2003, and the gallery business is an interesting business. We work really hard at making people welcome at the gallery and um, educating them about the work that, that we sell, but the reach of a physical gallery is quite limited. What we do is really move from the world of the gallery, which works for a few, to bringing together the world of artists and the world of consumers through the internet. That's what you see on the right side here. And really using the power of the internet to amass large audiences of consumers and connect them to large numbers of artists. This is a, a, a great photo, I think it's a great photo, by Gursky, but one of the things in that happens when you have a lot of content or a lot of choices is it becomes overwhelming. It's very hard to pick what you want. Finding um, art that you like is generally uh, very difficult, either because you're seeing a lot of bad things or you're finding a lot of, of, of what you don't like. And if you look at a lot, a lot of it, after a while it all sort of looks the same. So, some people default to the familiar. <laughs> I would guess that they're probably, oh no. <laughs> um, there have probably been a million copies of the dogs playing poster, po playing poker, poker poster sold. And it, it, it's a sad comment on, I don't think everybody that bought this really wanted this, but I think if they had found or been able to find better examples, they would have bought them. But You've got, to, you've got to find your match. So what do we do to help turn customers into connoisseurs? How do, how do, you, how do you get started? If your entry point is, um, you know, a, a, an amazing de Koenig oil painting, there are only a few people that are going to be able to participate. And that's a hard part. So we really start with what we call the gateway drug to the art world. <laughs> For those of you that don't recognize it, that's a marijuana leaf. <laughs> um, and, and we work with um, an, array, an amazing range of artists from emerging artists to very established conceptual artists like Lawrence Wiener. And we start with each edition we do at a 20 or a $50 price point. That's why we call it the gateway drug of the art world. That's okay. <laughs> and we offer them in a broad array of sizes. Next. And unlike a lot of, uh, a, a lot of sites that, that deal in art, we give people entry points that they're familiar with. How, how do people get in? How do they get excited? And Thank you. <laughs> you weren't a Navy club in high school, were you? <laughs> Those shoes, no way. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, um, we, we break a lot of art world traditions at the same time that we try to bring these audiences of artists and, and collectors together. And one of the examples of that is being able to browse by color. You know, a, a lot of people that like art buy art based on decor. I'm sorry, and, and that's, you know, heresy for a lot of people, but there are, you know, a certain number of people who, for whom that's really helpful. And so we do give them the ability to buy by color. Next. Next. Did that go? Okay. Um, the other piece of the puzzle is um, there's different kinds of shopping, right? Sometimes you know exactly what you want. Like, I have run out of toothpaste. I want to get another six ounce tube of Crest 
ultra whitening, right? You can go into a place like Amazon, type in Crest ultra whitening and find it, or Google wherever. Most people don't know exactly what they want in a category like art. What is it that you want? What is it that you need? And so it's a hard thing to search for. So we find it important to build a relationship with our customers and to really create an experience rather than just a transaction. And one of the ways we do that is by having a, a, a newsletter. And so we have over 50,000 newsletter subscribers. And each newsletter helps people understand a bit more about the artist, a bit more about the work, so that people are getting educated, so they develop an appreciation for the work as well as the person who's creating the work. And this is a, a provocative. We sell actually a fair amount of, of text art. This is an artist named Mike Montero. And, um, you know, there it comes with a certificate of authenticity as well as an, an artist statement. This is uh, a, great, a great designer and artist, Paula Scher. Some of you may have seen a lithograph of this at Union Square Cafe. Um, that's a, a really gorgeous, large, large piece of work. Um, and we worked with, with Paula and we were able to offer this uh, really starting at $50 so that people could experience the work of Paula Scher in, in their, their own home, even though she would be otherwise beyond their reach. And of course, this we all know, happy customers are great marketing, right? And so when we get uh, wonderful comments from our customers, and uh, here's one that we got. Um, you guys, I'm so excited right now, I could pee in my pants. And, um, you know, that makes us feel really good. It does. It does. And, you know, I don't know how it makes them feel, but, you know, for us, it's, it's, it's really wonderful. And we all know that one of the great ways to build a business is by having really happy customers. So this is basically how we feel. Live with art. It's good for you. Thanks. Great. Thank you, David. So, um, uh, so I want to go around the, around the horn fast. Uh, what, what is the digital trend, consumer trend right now that's really getting your attention? Who wants to kick it off? I, I, uh, I think with the launch of Spotify this week, um, free music services and the pending launch of Apple's cloud-based music um, storage, I think um, the whole concept of cloud-based computing and not having a device at your house for storage of media, either media you've created through your own photography or video, but now um, media that you have bought through Amazon, um, iTunes, Spotify, et cetera, living in other places is really getting my attention right now. And everyone know what a cloud is? I mean, it's basically um, iCloud uh, just launched recently, and it allows you to, to store everything um, so that you can access it from many of your different Apple devices rather than having to be tethered to a computer. So, so here's two examples of cloud-based systems. One is iDisk, which is um, any of you who have Apple computers, there's an option to store your pictures, your um, data files, your videos. Um, so that they're not stored locally on your computer, but if you went to a web cafe or your friend's house, you could just log in through a URL and have access through your own passwords to your specific information. Other examples of that um, are Google, Gmail, Yahoo Mail. Those are other examples of, if you will, cloud-based, where you're logging into a website to access information that's particular to you. And you know, to underscore that point, um, Google and Gmail, which started as more of a personal usage um, functionality, increasingly I hear so many businesses that are using Google Docs, which is basically businesses' ability to store very large files, allow people in multiple locations geographically to access them without having those things stored. Storage fees from an operations perspective are reduced for the company because basically Google is paying to run all the computers that are storing all that information. So with that baseline, now you overlay entertainment services like music, or for any of you that use Kindle, if you have a Kindle device, 
and you have an iPhone, you can put a Kindle app on your iPhone and it'll sync. It knows where you are in your book, whether it's on the actual Kindle itself or the Kindle app, and that's using that same type of mm. underlying functionality um, for you to have an entertainment. And so I think that the um, presence of entertainment through the cloud is really interesting. David, um, I know, David, you have a big music collection. Are you uh, storing your stuff on, on the cloud, and are you buying a lot of music these days? Well, yeah, it's funny. In, in my basement actually live up in Springs. I've got about 4,000 vinyl discs and probably 2,000 CDs. I haven't bought anything physical in probably the past five years. So what are you doing? Um, I buy a few things from time to time via iTunes, but generally I have a subscription service actually. It's about $10 a month to Rhapsody, and they have an amazing catalog of music. and. I access it via my phone, via my iPad. I have it hooked up to my sound system. If I'm on the road traveling, open it up, turn it on, and I've got all my music with me. It's great. It's fantastic. It's great. I was just going to say that, you know, it's interesting. I think our virtual lives are a mess. Um, <laughs> and Speak for yourself. Virtual, just the virtual mine, mine ones? Is. I, I mean, I have 4,000 photos from the last year on my iPhone. Put it a little closer. Oh, sorry. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Um, I have 4,000 photos on my iPhone. I have music on six different devices. Um, you know, you talk about consumer trends. I mean, I, I fundamentally see two. Um, one is education centers literally will start popping up for people like me who have no idea what they're talking about. You know, mm -hmm. I, I have no time to go to Rhapsody. I have, I, you know, I think I have no time. And actually, I probably could get more time if I had it organized. And I was driving here from Hampton Bays and I saw all the cooking schools. And I said, you know, we really need, I said to myself, we need technology schools. We need mm -hmm. the growth of brands that will help people learn. And speaking of which, I think the most horrible interfaces in the world right now are created by the very brands we just talked about. I, I just think, don't think, I think there's one person, Steve Jobs, who is a unique blend of chromosomes that can really get in touch like a Martha or an Oprah with what the real person, hmm. how they navigate, how they use technology. We need to start marrying, you know, and Hollywood's in trouble right now. We hear about that economically. 3D movies aren't doing well, partly because, pe you know, there's a four out of five households make less than $55,000 a year in this country. And if you don't think that's, you know, an interesting way to live, try doing it for some of you who don't they can't afford 3D. So Hollywood companies are starting to flounder, but it would be interesting as a trend to bring it back here to what your question was, if Sony teamed up with Google to really improve their user experience or teamed up with Disney or teamed up with a content company that knows how to entertain and use navigation because I can't find half the things that I hear about and I'm in the business. <laughs> So I think those are the two trends we're going to start to see. It's better user experience and actually going out and physically teaching people how to do it. Great. Something about, uh, you know, we all kind of touched on this a little bit, and, uh, you know, I do work in the video space, so this might be a little self-serving. Um, th this whole concept of how we're consuming content, and, and I'm a voracious consumer of media, news, journalism, uh, movies, television shows I probably don't want to mention here um, that I watch religiously, but how we're all watching and consuming those things almost inexorably have, has changed without us noticing how quickly that's happened. I haven't bought a newspaper in probably three years, and I read probably five newspapers a day. Um, I haven't watched a television ad, a live television ad, in probably two or three years. But I know every marketing campaign that's happening because I'm consuming that content in different places. And so when you ask about what the future is, it's, it's how we're consuming this content and how we're being affected by the messaging and the marketing and whether I'm watching television on my iPad on the side of a coffee cup, uh, you know, on a billboard somewhere. That's, I think, the fascinating piece. The social fabric of how we consume media is changing. We're not huddled around our TVs anymore as families, as friends, et cetera. We're consuming all of this in very individual ways. And that, to me, is a real fascinating social tie 
divide between media, marketing, sort of the fabric of who we are as people. And I'm hoping it's a positive thing, and, and we can all work to make it a positive thing. But it's, that to me is, is, is really kind of the next 10 years that's a sea change that I have no way of predicting what it's going to look like. Yeah, and it's not even just content. It's just accessing information, accessing your social um, graph. Um, you know, I did a fair amount of research at Hearst when we launched a, a product, a mobile product, that allows you to track the things that matter to you with really high-quality content sources. And it was like an addiction. You know, the, uh, you know we're, we're, we're never unplugged. You know, we're, we're, you know, whether we're on a bus, between meetings, you know, whatever, you know, at the gym, in the locker room at the gym, we're, we're checking our, we're checking all of these things. I, I, I want to ask um, uh, the audience, um, I'm just curious, uh, um, audience participation, um, what's the first thing you do in the morning when you wake up? Do you brush your teeth and get freshened up? Come on, show of hands, let's see. Uh, check your email? Before brushing your teeth, right? Uh, Facebook profile? Post to Facebook? No? Okay. Um, how about saying good morning to the one you love next to you? <laughs> Nobody. Okay. <laughs> one. One. <laughs> Two. <laughs> um, uh, you know, how many, um, uh, how many of you have a mobile phone and a landline? Okay. How about you guys? <laughs> you, you do? Okay. I, 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 <laughs> I, re I really wanted to have both, but um, the, the landline that we had was a battery-operated device, and so my whole rationale for having that one, too, went away, because if the power went out, that thing wouldn't work. So I wanted that thing that would still be working, and then when that wasn't available anymore, we're, so I just have a cell phone now. Great segue to the next question. How many battery-operated devices do you have on you right now? One? Two, three, three. I saw somebody with three. Three over there. Four, two. Okay, very good. Um, how many of you subscribe to newspapers, local or national? Both. Okay. Um, and my last question: Has anyone? Oh, okay. Uh, we talked about Facebook. How many of you have Facebook profiles? Okay, so how many of you um, uh, go on to Facebook once a week? Once a day? Twice a day? Okay, all right, good. And the last question, how many of you have not bought something online? Everybody's bought something online. Okay, good. So um, next thing I wanna talk about is, is, is Facebook. I mean, um, and, and social media in general, and I think, um, as I was thinking about preparing for this, you know, I, I kind of personally feel like social media sometimes gets a really bad rap, and that um, it, it's not just about sending pictures and, and tweets. It's also about you know um, connecting with business professionals through LinkedIn and things like that. And um, I just want to talk to you all about you know how how are how are brands and how are consumers using using social media that that strikes you as interesting. Well, I love that question because um, I was originally cynical about social media, especially as Facebook became this repository for people to tell you all the inane things that you didn't even want to talk to them on the phone about. Um, and so, um, but I think that there's a lot of tool sets that have come into play. Um, I mean, I have some of them up here that um, are culling social media uh, from a business and um, research perspective and making it a lot more sensible, um, you know, Pulse News, Flipboard, um, and TweetDeck are, are tools that I use a lot, Pulse News and Flipboard, um, pulling in from, um, from social media to make sense of what journalists and or voices and curators that I respect are saying and putting it together in one place that's easy, so Hollywood Reporter, Vanity Fair Daily, um, you know, any kind of news that I'm interested in, Huffington Post, Fast Company, and all of these feeds are coming in basically from Twitter, but it's presenting it in an interesting way. So I really like that. And, you know, Flipboard takes a little bit of another approach by presenting it to look like a magazine. Um, you know, so these are things that TED Talks or my own Twitter feed, Grant a Magazine, 
uh, Instagram, whatever I'm interested in, but presenting it in you know kind of an interesting way. So I feel like this is social media. Um, this is a whole other aspect of social media that actually you know is the Twitter feed that you're accustomed to, but you know is an easier way to look at this in ways that maybe I was accustomed to from a magazine. So I think that the, the immediacy of journalism now with better curation and or filter tools taking the best of what magazines and or to a certain extent newspapers have provided for us is pretty fantastic. Um, and, and these curation tools allow us to filter out the crap of you know, blogs that don't really make sense or people that aren't consistent in contributing as well as bring the best of all of the journalism and the respected sources or entertainment as it may be that's available. Uh, a couple, a couple. Um, I'm sorry. Just a couple of stats that I think are pretty wild. Um, if uh, f Facebook has 750 million users, and if it was a country, it would be the third largest country in the world, um, which is pretty amazing. 50% um, of those users go on to Facebook every day, and there are over 700 billion minutes spent on Facebook per month. 700 billion minutes. That's just kind of boggles my mind. It would be a mind. very, very noisy country. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, audio's coming to Facebook. Any, any other thoughts about Facebook? I, I had an interesting experience with Facebook. And again, I, I've been, um, uh, you know, been in the digital side of, of business, uh, as Michael said, since 95. Um, although I'm youthful looking, I'm older than I look. Um, and I had a, a, cup, a company I was running a couple years ago, uh, one of the developers came up to me and I had been uh, running the company for about a year at that point. And uh, you know, he was kind of nervous and he you know, came up to me and he's like, I don't understand. And I'm like, don't understand what? And he says, how could you not be on Facebook? And I was like, well, what are you talking about? Of course, I was on Facebook. And he's like, well, I can't find you. But I had made my Facebook profile private to the people who I wanted to deal with on a regular basis. That concept was so bizarre and alien to this person who was 20 years younger yep. than me. He just couldn't understand. And, and I tried to make the analogy. It's like, I don't want everyone calling me. <laughs> I don't want everyone I meet on the jitney or yep. on the subway to have my phone number. And that's kind of how I used Facebook as a way to interact with the people I wanted to interact with. But I'm the last of that. Yep. I mean, that doesn't exist for the people coming behind well, I, us. I, I do the same thing. I mean, I use LinkedIn, which is like a professional social uh, network, for those of you who, who don't use it, which is a great tool for recruiting people and for connecting from a network perspective. That's my, that's my business social network. And Facebook, I really try to restrict from, you know, from colleagues and, and, and business associates. So um, I, I totally agree with you. Yeah, we really like using Facebook at 20 by 200 as a way to get response from our customers. So we do, you know, different sorts of quizzes or contests from time to time. It's a really easy way to get sort of interactive, if you will, um, with your customers. And that's one of the real strengths we find about it. So, um, so I have to be honest, my... Um, I've noticed, you know, the, a, a broad spectrum of behavior on Facebook, at least in my life. You know, I have a, a large group of friends and family members who um, use it sort of on a regular basis, and then I have some that are really afraid to share information. And then I have my nephew who is sharing everything about his life to me every hour of the day, um, every whim, every thought that passes through his mind, and I, it scares me a little bit. And um, as, as I know, as I've hired many people over the years, I know that employers look at your Facebook profiles, they look at your LinkedIn profiles, they look at what you're tweeting and what you're sharing um, as part of the process. And I've been trying to figure out, Michael, how, to, how, do, we, how do we deal with this and how do we, you know, um, how do we start to educate people on, on what to do with, with social media? Well, I mean, you know, first of all, I became a prolific uh, social networker in my 40s. So, you know, like a lot of us on the stage, we were well into our adulthood, and we learned what appropriate behavior was. Um, we learned what's appropriate to say to people, what libel is, what defamation is, what bullying is, what abuse is. Um, and I love social networks. Um, and I've been sort of thinking about several things. One is we face a dire fiscal situation in this country that's being debated as we all sit here, uh, number one. Number two, we have a new wave of technology, which in the 1990s, when you started, Anthony, and most of us did, in digital, 
it provided surpluses to our country. So how do we leverage sort of what's happening in order to, and the most fundamental thing, and I have a lot of teens in my family, including a gaggle of kids. I have my own teenagers, my own children, and I watch what they post. And I am friends with them. I follow them. They follow me. Uh, we have conversations about what they post. It's crossed the line. Uh, we have conversations about what's appropriate behavior. We have conversations about apologizing to people that you may have offended. And this has all happened in my household. So the thing that we've been talking about is thinking about, at least my, and my teen son and I wrote this for our own congressmen and senators here in New York, is to think about a Family Protection Networking Act, where we literally, just like they had to do about the same age as the automobile, license social network. Educate, certify, and license social networking so we teach people, like we do right now in the state of New York, a three-tiered program to teach people how to become an independent driver. My son is currently 16. He started six months ago. He got a driver's license where he can only drive with his parents. It could parallel. When you're a young age, maybe 12 or 14, you can go on networks, but only if your parents approve what's being posted. Parents have got to get more involved in their kids' lives. They have to help them understand what is appropriate behavior as we do from a party to driving to shopping, to spending, to communicating. And we have to think about what can this mean to help protect our people as well so that free speech can proliferate. People aren't afraid to post. There should be no afraid, but old laws are being broken on new ways. And we have to think about how do we allow freedom of speech and our constitutional right to happiness to proliferate while we protect uh, our people, but also create, frankly, a new revenue stream. Just like the Department of Motor Vehicles became a very big revenue stream for every state in this country, we have a new platform that we could also leverage to start ensuring that we are teaching our people, uh, we are certifying them, we are penalizing them as we do with driving, and we are taking away their licenses if they break certain laws like harming children or harming anyone else. So. This is something that I think is starting to gain steam in many of uh, quarters. Of course, the popular quarters are the ones who tend to control the beltway and don't like to see this kind of proliferation. But personally, I think we have a great vehicle. 750 million people are now on Facebook alone. And we have the opportunity to think about where is this going to take our great democracy? Mm -hmm. And we've seen democracies being tested and ones that are not democracies being tested by turning on and off switches and things. And that's an interesting thing to observe yeah. and bring back, so. Yeah, you know, I, I think, I often think a lot of consumers don't even realize um, how often Facebook changes its policies, and um, it's, which has been a big issue. Um, and, uh, you know, many of you may not know this, but if you don't watch the privacy policies on Facebook, they have things rights to do things like use your pictures that you post in advertising across Facebook um, to friends and, and other people who sort of demographically look like you. So um, I think data is, yeah, exactly. Um, other bald people, yes. Oh, wow. and um, targeted marketing up here. <laughs> Twitter owns 100% of your image. And from a financial perspective, 100% of your image they own when you post. That means that they could sell it to Geary Photos if you take a picture with Dwayne Wade at a bar and make $300 on it, and the consumer makes nothing. So I'm talking about the financial aspect, but there's also that... The consumer side. The consumer aspect. Yeah, absolutely. Any other thoughts on Facebook? No? no. You sure? Well, well the, the, no. there's... The, <laughs> sorry, but, please. Well, I mean, only that uh, Facebook has a, a big new competitor that's just entered the marketplace, so it'll be interesting to see with Google's approach into this social network. Um, they're leading forward with the ability to do what you seem to have found it easy to segment out your profile and associate with people that you only want to associate that seems to be the big thrust behind their product differentiator. But um, you know, Google, when you start running the numbers, also touches a significant number of people. And while it might not have the elegance of an Apple product yet, um, but they seem to do really well with the technology underpinning. So it'll be interesting to see what happens in a year from now, um, where Facebook stands, if Google's attempt in this space takes off. Um, and, we just and, need and, more and, artists in yeah. the science. Right. What, what right. you're seeing David's company do. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. I think what, uh, what the new offering from Google really does is reflect much more the way we live, which is 
There are certain things we talk about with people in the office. There are other things we talk about with our families. There are other things we talk about with our friends. The, 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 one of the tricks with Facebook is that we're talking to everybody the same way. And that just doesn't really mirror the way we behave as people. And so I, I, I think that's really a point of exposure for Facebook. And, um, and one that's, you know, led to certainly, to your point, Michael, people are posting, you know, whoa, I had an amazing night last night. Like, up go all the pictures from the party. And then, you know, two days later, they're interviewing for a job and somebody goes and checks out their Facebook profile. And it's like, whoa, I don't think so. One, like one, of my, one of my favorites was uh, uh, some college kid who posted that he had met a girl at a bar last night and had a good time, and, and his mom liked it. And she, you know, she, wrote, she hit the like, and he was like, Mom, what are you doing, you know? And she was like, oh my gosh, how do I unlike this? You know, she was, she was tracking her college-age son. I thought it was pretty funny. <laughs> you know, there's an interesting technology I've seen that, and I don't mean to be Mr. Regulation up here, but it happens to go with approval. If, I, if we, somebody takes a picture of all of us, there's a technology that I, I just heard about on Thursday, literally at lunch, where it has to go to all of us on email and we all have to click approve to have it posted. And I think that's a pretty darn good thing to think about. But it's we, interesting. I mean, all the stuff that we're talking about, um, you know, Facebook didn't exist or um, a lot of these things, uh, we're all learning and tripping and stubbing our toes a little bit, the companies that are creating it and all of us as participants along the way. And it's all happening so quickly. But, um, you know, all of these ways that we're communicating is the version of, you know, did the operator used to listen at the switchboard when she put your call through, right? <laughs> right, so that we've gone from that to the ability to have three-way calling when I'm I was in high school and then there was somebody listening you always called somebody and somebody was like secretly listening and so now you know you move into now what we do with the speed with which something can go up um, and or out through email and so as our technologies and ability to connect um, there's all the beautiful attributes of it which are great but unfortunately there are all of these stumbling blocks for the companies and being up front which I don't think enough are being forward about the privacy implications with all of these delightful devices that provide GPS, that's great if you're trying to figure out where Guild Hall is. It stinks if someone's surreptitiously tracking you and using that information and you didn't give them permission. If you tell a marketer or a retailer that any time you drive within five miles and they're having 50% off to send you a text message, that's great. If they decide to do it on their own, then that's not so great. Yep. And, and, and that's the same core technology that you both love, but I think this is a really interesting time with things moving so quickly to, like you said, Michael, you know, there's, there are some room for regulation and, and there's some social responsibility that we as the citizens using these tools need to take a part in. Well, there's a really, I, you know, there, there's this very interesting thing with advertising, which is, you know, when you're in the market for something or when you're interested in something and you get a marketing message, it's really service, you know? It's like, wow, you know what? I was gonna, I am in the market for a sweater and now I can get one for a third less than I was gonna pay for it, fantastic. On the other hand, when you get those messages at the wrong time or when you're not interested, they're totally obnoxious. And so one of the, the tricks with technology is, is figuring out how, how we do get those messages to our customers when, when they want them and when they're excited to get them because then they love it. Yep. And every time you get one, when you don't, it, it really moves you away from that, that company. Well, I was just going to say, I mean, it's interesting, the trick, Agenesis is a, a company that um, I'm investing and in operating uh, with, and we work through publishers. So just like an airline gives you points for buying a seat, or American Express gives you membership reward points for using their card, um, we're going to help publishers and broadcasters online especially give rewards for viewing. And how we do that is we allow um, the partners that we work with, uh, from Parade Magazine to others, to create video rewards. Um, and this is making advertising not annoying anymore, but rewarding so that you pay attention. But we start with a real good trick, which is asking the consumer, what is your life? What do you want to buy? Not what you've bought. Amazon does a lot of what you've bought. Oh, you like romantic novels. So that's one aspect. 
But if you're in the market for a phone or a car or a computer or you know, whatever it is, you want to take as many seven passenger vehicle ads as you can get so you can compare. So what we do is you join through our publishers, you give up information about your life that we never share, sell, tag, haunt, hunt, market, any of that. We only use it to match you to brands that would be of most relevance to you. And right now, the little banner ads you see on your web screens when you're all checking your email, which a lot of you do, only generates about a 0.5% click-through rate, 0.5%. That means 99.5% of those ads aren't getting clicked on. And when you do the asking, what are you in the market for? What is your life like? What's your favorite genre of movie? And deliver videos from those brands, we average 11% click-through rate. So for the marketers and for you, it's clearly more valuable. And for the publishers, which we have got to save, we've got to save the New York Times, we have to save the Financial Times, we have to save all of journalism, these are great things that we need to start evolving so that we can fund these forms of communication that are vital to our country. You know? have to we save the daily, too. We need to relocate. Uh, I think well, it's a good time to walk to DC. Let's go down to DC. We have to evolve. That was a softball. Come we on. We have to evolve our advertising <laughs> so that we are able to, because we really haven't evolved it. If you think about it, video has been our really greatest evolution. And how do we start to really match it to people and, and cut out all the I, crap? Like I, want to, I want to riff on something you just said, talking about relevance, and I, think, I want to talk about curation, um, sort of the age of digital curation. And, um, you know, those who can separate the quality from all the junk that you get in your search results, you know, and they use sort of a combination of automation and human intervention, um, and many of them are using both. And um, I, I think it's a really interesting, you know, a, a really interesting area of, of, uh, of growth opportunity um, to whittle it down to, you know, the most relevant marketing messaging or, or information from the most authoritative quality sources delivered to you and things like that. So any thoughts on curation? Yeah, the, the, the curation piece, you know, we live in, a, in this incredibly exploding world of, of access and options and choices. And listen, I live in this world, and I find it completely bewildering. I mean, it is, it is a nonstop from the moment I wake up in the morning, from Monday to Friday, to the minute I put my head down on the pillow, it is an information fire hose coming at me from work, from friends, from Twitter, from Facebook, from news, from everywhere. And it's unmanageable. And it's, and it's hugely important to be able to find the outlets, whether it's the Daily, or Pulse News, which I'm a huge fan of because I can whittle down the things I'm interested, the topics I'm interested in learning more about, and have that pushed to me in a reasonable fashion. I am 100% not on Twitter, period. Yay. 140 characters is not even enough to say good morning. So <laughs> I just don't think it's enough information to have a meaningful interaction with a piece of content. But importantly, around the curation piece, and whoever nails that, I think is going to, and I think Google Plus is trying to do this, and I yep. think they're, they're going to do a good job of it. It's important to not be digital, right? Because what I find, I have a beautiful house in Montauk that I come out to every weekend, and I dig a hole in the ground of some type every weekend. <laughs> I'm dirty somehow every weekend with dirt under my nails. And I return back to that digital life on Monday, and I have such an increased ability to absorb content in a meaningful manner. And I have a wide group of friends, I'll sit down at dinner, and you have them too, and everyone's phones are out, and we're all reading, tweeting, blogging, facing, booking, whatever it is that we're doing. And, and we have to continue to find this balance of absorb information in an efficient way, but you know, we are humans as well. So I just wanna challenge one thing that you're saying in that... Um, Good. <laughs> I'll only challenge one. The, uh, I think that you're right. The, the, the touch points in, in, in working lives now, you wake up, you have a Blackberry, you have an iPhone, and then you, you're expected to read the email on the way to the office before you sit in front of a computer all day and are expected to call through billions of emails, et cetera. Um, but the thing I was going to get at is on the weekend, um, 
the digital transformation of information versus the masses of information are two different things. And you're saying you don't want to be digital on the weekend. I think you know the reason for existence of the daily is to be the future of newspaper publishing, magazine publishing for the future. No trees, no trucks to drive and have to distribute what were the old forms of delivery mechanisms. And I think that there are delivery mechanisms that can transport to us and deliver to us the kinds of journalism and or entertainment that we're accustomed to when we want to consume them. But that doesn't mean that it's an absolutely anti-digital world. And so the tablets are fascinating for that as the beginning of a delivery mechanism for that right now. What those delivery mechanisms look like in the future, does the tablet become the remote control for the television? You know, and again, we've talked about cloud-based storage of um, information. So I think that we're going to have an increasingly digital world and reduce the need for uh, paper and trucks to deliver and, and, and the delivery mechanism. It's a fair point. And, and for the record, I did fix my tractor this morning with my iPad with an exploded parts diagram <laughs> on the ground next to it. So fair point. My, my wife uh, takes the iPad into the kitchen and is, you know, uh, dumping cake batter all over it, and well, I'm trying to get her to realize it's a thousand dollar computer, well, and maybe this, maybe a, something, maybe a piece of paper would wants be better. a new one. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> the cover is magnetic. It actually, if you put an iPad with this cover on your refrigerator, it'll hold it up. Really? There. So you I, maybe I have, have less cake batter on it. You are a font of knowledge. I really well, want Martha's, you to have your own TV show because the whole from thing Martha is Stewart just... to the Daily, I can do a lot of home decor <laughs> it's technology a combination. Fix for a tractor. You. And I can not fix the um, tractor. A community bank grows with its neighborhoods. Bridgehampton National Bank has embraced the needs of local businesses throughout Suffolk County, Long Island. Bridgehampton National Bank has been one of the most important partners that Guildhall has had, and they are helping us with the funding of this wonderful renovation. We actually couldn't do it without Bridgehampton National Bank. Bridgehampton National Bank, many success stories, one bank. This broadcast of the Hamptons Institute at Guildhall is being brought to you by Bridgehampton National Bank. Just quickly on Twitter, um, you know, I, I'm not a huge Twitter user, I have to be honest. I, I think that I, I use it for tracking people that matter to me, you know, like to stay on top of um, different people in our business and things like that. But the numbers are just astounding. Um, it took three years, two months, and one day for Twitter to reach its one billionth tweet. And today, there's a billion tweets being sent out each week. Mm. So it's just, it's just unbelievable when you start to think about the scale of these things. And you also look at how Twitter was used in Egypt during, um, during you know, the political uprising, and that was like a main form of, of communication to the outside world during that process. And so I think there's some real value that it, it provides, but um, it, it's just astounding to me. But what to the, you don't have to tweet to like Twitter, right? So I think that's the trap. Yep. People that's think like, well, so you may have to log in so that you can start to look. But I mean, I like to watch broadcast news. <laughs> I'm not a broadcast news correspondent, yep. but you know, I mean, it's, it's kind of that way. So if you want to tweet and put stuff out there, great. But I think that Twitter actually, like we were showing before, provides a lot of functionality and perspective into the world without you having to do it. Yeah, it's, it, and I love things like Flipboard that help take that Twitter experience and put it in, at least for me, into a format that feels a lot more familiar and a lot more engaging. And uh, the way I often use, uh, the way I typically use Twitter is very much like there are a number of different people that I follow, many, many obviously in the, the digital arena, but other people in the art arena or the marketing arena or the design arena. And it really allows me to sort of like sort of customize my, my, news, my news source. Yep. And I, I have to say, I, I found it a really good experience. I don't tweet much. Well, I was going to say, I think uh, Twitter, to go back to your original question of what trends we're going to see, I came across a great company for actually all of you called Blurts. Uh, Peter Grossman from J. Walter Thompson started, mm. which is sort of akin to no longer typing in a caption on a Facebook photo, but actually doing an audio uh, blurt. 
so it's you bring sort of humanity back to the web. And I think tweets, um, I don't really tweet a lot. I, I don't really follow it a lot because it's like a to-do list I'll never get to. It's like a constant, overwhelming, you know, I can never keep up. Somebody will say, my son will say, I tweeted that on Tuesday. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. You know, I have to go back through all the tweets to find your, you know. But I, I think it's also about bringing people together live. And I think, Anthony, you touched on that. You know, um, all renaissance are defined by bridging geography and linking people of common thoughts, ideas, experiences. And um, from knitting, if we can really crack this code, it's from knitting to losing weight to dealing with the loss of a spouse or what have you. How do you help people? The, the greatest information actually comes from the circles that Google is uh, touched well, on. And, and I think what we're finding, you know, I, I was talking a little bit earlier, you know, when the, the gay marriage vote was going on in, in the New York Senate, I was watching Twitter feeds live, I was watching it streaming on the web, but then at the same time I was having conversations with people, both via Twitter and Facebook, my friends, about what was going on. And so it was allowing us to sort of share the experience, even though we weren't all in the same physical place, we were still having a shared experience. And so when you talk about sort of the humanity, in fact we were using technology to bring us together and to have a group experience even though we were physically in very, very different locations. But then once it passed, what was on the news that night? Everyone was brought together, you know, they right. wanted to be physically right. with people and to I celebrate. And I think that's attributed to our evolution as being a part of this new way of communication. And, um, I, on the Kindle app that we have up here is uh, David Carr's What the Internet's Doing to Your Brain, you know, which is like digesting all these quick little bits of information. But um, I think that the backlash against that is that people seek that old, some of the things from the old world to add to and bring along into the world that we have right now. We were talking about um, Marshall McClellan earlier, the, the medium is the message, and the big freak out then was, oh my God, TV is going to displace books. Well, guess what? Books seem to be doing fairly well. Now, I don't know that any of us would have imagined the portability of what digital books look like now, whether it's on your Nook or your Kindle or on your app or on your computer or where it is, but we're doing seemingly fine with reading a lot of books. As a matter of fact, now you can read more books now more easily than you could have before because you take one device and you have 10 books with you. Um, and, and the audio is really interesting too. And the, the, for the daily, you know, we produce 100 to 120 pages of original journalism every day, and we tell those stories mm. by taking the best from all mediums. So we have broadcast journalism pieces, we have full screen uh, photography, and we have long form written content. And we invite people to comment, so you can either type or leave an audio comment. And mm. it's fascinating to mm. listen to someone who's articulating verbally a comment that they normally would have typed and you can hear the TV in the background, or you can hear the dog barking, or the kids running by, and this intimacy all of a sudden with the community that's a national community in a way that you didn't have before. So it's the community because we both read the daily, not necessarily because you're my friend on Facebook. Christine, have you, have you seen any real, um, and I realize it's early on, but have you seen any dramatic differences in behavior, or, or your colleagues who are from traditional newspapers and what have you, have they seen dramatic differences other than what you've just described in, in user behavior? In user behavior, um, we see that our readers are primarily news consumers. They're aggressive news consumers. Um, here, I'll pull it up while we're talking about it. They, um, they're reading it about five days a week. They're coming in regularly. The difference that you have from this than a regular newspaper is you actually can see when people are coming back. They're actually reading it throughout the day, which I think is pretty much very common to what you would do if you had a real newspaper. You mm -hmm. read some in the morning and you stuff it in your bag and then you pull it back out. We definitely are seeing um, those same behaviors. But, um, you know, outside of that, the ability to share more easily, I think, um, I mean, this just gives you all a sense of kind of what their experience looks like. Don't make me dizzy. Oh, I'll go much slower. Teasing you. Sorry. This is a great one to end on. Born and dead. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I think that uh, the only other thing that's different here is that it, it is a big mixture of news and entertainment. And so people are, you know, throughout the day coming in for all different things. So did you guys know that J-Lo broke up? She did. I didn't Aww. know that. Wait, what about J-Lo? She is she getting is? a divorce. 
She and Mark Antony? <laughs> <laughs> you can say where you were when, when they ask you when you found out. Right. We, we know where, where, so now that we know where you were when you found out about this, where were you when Osama we're bin the Laden Hamptons was Institute. captured? Yeah, where were you when, where were you, um, David? You told us a great story before. Hmm? Oh, yeah, I, I was on a plane flying back from San Francisco, and we'd, we'd actually seen something on CNN that was on.